Hello, third grade, and welcome to week two of unit four. Let's go ahead and get started with our vocabulary words for this week. Your first word is the word embarrassed. Now, when you feel embarrassed, you feel shy and uncomfortable. Um, sometimes you feel like your face gets really red when you feel embarrassed. Your second word is the word talent. Talents are natural abilities or skills, something that you're just really good at, not necessarily something that you practice a whole lot, but it's something that you're just good at doing. Some people are really good at drawing. Uh, some people are really good at different kinds of sports. Next, we have the word apologize. Now, when you apologize, it means you said sorry, right? We made a mistake and we said sorry, or we apologize. Our next word is the word audience. Now, when we're talking about an audience, the audience is the group of people who are watching or listening to something. So if you go to example for, if you go to a play, right? And you're sitting and watching the play, you're part of the audience. You're part of that group of people who are watching uh, the performance or the thing that's happening. You can be an audience member in an award ceremony. If you're sitting and watching awards being given out to other people or you can be sitting in the audience if you go to a movie theater. Next, we have the word attention. So if you pay attention to something, that means you're listening and looking really carefully. You're focused and you're thinking about that. You're not distracted and doing something else. You're giving all of your focus to that thing. So you're listening very carefully. You're watching very carefully, whatever that thing is. Next, we have the word realized. When you realize something, you notice it or you understand it. So something uh, that you either just remembered or something that just finally made sense. So I realized that I left my notebook at home. It was lost and I couldn't find it and I kept thinking and thinking and I realized I left it at home. Next, we have the word achievement. So an achievement is something that you've done and it worked, it was successful. So if I say the talent show was a great achievement for the class, that means the members of the class, right? All the students worked really hard to put on this talent show and it went really well, it was great. So that was a great achievement. They achieved that goal. And our last word is the word confidence. So when you have confidence, you believe in yourself. You know you can do whatever it is. You know you're good at whatever it is. So uh, if, you are, if you are someone who likes to draw all the time and you feel like you're good at drawing, you have confidence in your skill, in your ability to draw. Next, we're going to get into our spelling words for this week. And this week we're working on plurals. Remember, plural means more than one. So two, three, four, five, anything that's more than one is a plural. So our words this week are the word years, twins, trays, states, ashes, foxes, inches, flies, cities, ponies, bunches, alleys, lunches, cherries, daisies, spoon, clues, shook, heroes, and libraries. Now, if you notice these words, we make them plural by adding an S or an ES to the end of it. And we have different rules that we need to follow so that we know which one we need to add for the word to be spelled correctly. Now, this is where we're going to talk again about our plural noun. So in order for us to understand how to spell these words correctly, we have to remind ourselves what the rules were for them. So we have an S, E, or E, S rule. So how do you know when you add an S and when you add an ES? So the ES rule says you only add an ES if your word ends with these letters, S, SH, CH, X, or Z. So class becomes classes, wish becomes wishes, watch becomes watches, box becomes boxes, buzz becomes buzzes. And you can hear yourself. You're not just saying, you're saying is at the end of it. So classes, wishes. So that's something to pay attention to when you're reading these words. You can hear the ES combination. So if that's the rule for ES, how do we know when we add just a regular S? 
So if your word ends with any of the other letters that are not S, S, H, C, H, X, or Z, and it does not end with a vowel plus Y, then, or sorry, it does end with a vowel plus Y or any other letter other than those five combinations that we talked about, then you just add an S onto the end of it. And you can hear the difference. So you say cats, toys, shoes, books, schools, boys, girls. You're just saying at the end of it, just that S sound, not is like you did with the ES sound. Now, I know you're going to look at these words and say, but Miss Anna, it says shoes right there and that has an ES at the end of it. It doesn't, it only has an S at the end of it because if I take that out, the word shoe is spelled S-H-O-E. That E is already there. So all I'm doing is adding an S to the end of it. Now, there are some words that we saw, even with our spelling words, where we're changing a Y to an I. So it's ending with letters that are I-E-S. So what is the I-E-S rule? How do I know when I do that? If my word ends with a consonant plus a Y, that means anything that's not a vowel, and the letter Y right after it, then I change the Y to an I and I add ES. So enemy becomes enemies, fly becomes flies, library becomes libraries, bunny becomes bunnies. So you see this, we have a consonant and a Y. So that consonant plus Y combination tells me switch that Y to an I and then add ES to the end of it. Next, we're going to talk about contractions using the word not. Now, a contraction is not two separate words, or sorry, it's not, um, it's not a word that has a prefix or a suffix on the end of it. It's not something with an inflectional ending like ed or ing on the end of it. A contraction is when we're taking two words and we're combining them into one word to make it shorter. And the way that we do this is we take out some of the letters from the words to make them shorter. And we use an apostrophe to take the place of those letters. Now remember, an apostrophe looks like a comma, but it's higher up. It's not sitting on the line. It's up near the top of those letters. So a contraction combines two words into one smaller word, and it leaves out one or more of the letters to make it shorter. Generally, what happens almost all the time is that the letters that are taken out are taken out of the second word. The first word almost always stays exactly the same. So the, the contractions we're going to focus on today are contractions with the word not. So a word plus not. So when we're adding not at the end of a word, we're going to replace that letter O with an apostrophe. So instead of it spe being spelled N-O-T, it's going to be spelled N apostrophe T. So do not becomes don't. Here's the D-O that stayed exactly the same as it did here. And N apostrophe T is how we shorten the word not. So did not, or sorry, do not becomes don't. Did not becomes didn't. Again, pay attention, did over here and did over here is still spelled exactly the same. It hasn't changed. Would not becomes wouldn't. We still have would spelled exactly the same and then N apostrophe T. Should not becomes shouldn't. We have the word should spelled exactly the same and apostrophe T. Now I do have two exceptions for you for this one and I put them at the bottom. Cannot becomes can't. So we don't say C-A-N-N -N apostrophe T. Can ends with, ends with the word letter N and not begins with the letter N. So we drop off one of those N's. So cannot becomes can't, C-A-N apostrophe T. And the next exception is will not. Will not, when we put it together, we say won't. We don't say willn't. Um, and there's a long history uh, linguistically about when this happened. I believe it was around the 16th century where linguists decided that they were going to replace will with the word would and shortened it instead of as would not and they changed it into won't. You don't need to worry about the history. Just remember will not becomes won't. This one is one of the biggest exceptions. The rest of them follow the rule very carefully. So you're, you'll be fine with the rest of them. These are the only two real exceptions and won't is 
kind of the bigger exception. It's easier to remember. Now, do not confuse contractions with possessive pronouns. Remember, contractions use apostrophes, right, in place of the missing letters, but possessives also use an apostrophe to show ownership. So if I say I'm, your, and can't, these are contractions. I'm is I am, like I'm going to the basketball game. Your, Y-O-U apostrophe R-E, is a contraction for you are. So that's, so an example sentence for that is, mom said, you are going to help me. You are going to help me. And next we have can't. Can't is cannot. They can't go to the park today. So these are contractions. Possessive pronouns have an apostrophe, but they show ownership. This is Sarah's pencil. So Sarah apostrophe S tells us that that pencil belongs to Sarah. When is Mardia, or where is Mardia's crayon? We're talking about the crayon that belongs to Mardia because we see the apostrophe S. Please find Ammar's backpack. We know from the sentence that apostrophe S after his name tells us that backpack belongs to Ammar. Now, the last thing we're going to talk about here are prefixes. We've talked about prefixes in the past. We're going to talk about them some more because we use them in our writing and speaking and reading all the time. Now, remember, prefix and suffix are both words that come from the word affix, which means to attach or to stick to something. Um, and they serve a purpose, their job or their role is to change the meaning of that base word that we attach them to. So a prefix comes before the word. Prefix has a prefix in it, has the word, it has the prefix pre. Pre means before. So some of the prefixes we're going to talk about today are pre, non, un, and im. So pre means before. So if you watch a preview, if you see a preview of a movie, you're watching kind of a short clip before the movie, before you see the whole thing. If mom has to preheat the oven before she bakes cookies, that means she has to heat it up first before she puts the cookies inside. If you have to pre-write something, that means you're writing it first and then you're going to go back and fix it up. If you ever went to the grocery store and you bought some veggies that were already in a bag, right? Some of the ones that are already sealed, a lot of them, they will say that they were pre-washed. That means they were washed before they were put in that bag. Next, we have non, un, and im. All of these have similar meanings. They all mean not or kind of like the opposite of something. So non, example words are non-fiction, something that is nonsense. If you buy some milk that is non-dairy, might be like almond milk, right? Non means not, it's not dairy, so it's not regular cow milk. Non-fiction means it's not fiction, we're talking about something that's real. Nonsense is something that doesn't make any sense, right? <clears throat> un, like the words unhappy, unclean, unfair, or unsure, that means you're not happy, something is not clean, you feel like something is not being done in a fair way, or you're not sure about something. And im, like impossible or imperfect or impolite. So impossible means not possible. Imperfect means it's not perfect. Impolite means something that is not polite or someone that is not polite. So that takes us to the end of our grammar and ELA notes. We're going to go ahead and jump into our stories. Now, our first story today is a really fun one. I think you're going to like it. It's called The Talented Clementine. Genre, Realistic Fiction Excerpt from The Talented Clementine by Sarah Pennypacker Pictures by Marla Frazzi Clementine has a big problem. She has no talents. And tonight is the big talent palooza. Every third and fourth grader will be dancing, singing, or turning cartwheels, except Clementine. Even Margaret, her best friend, has an act. Now Clementine has to tell Mrs. Rice, the principal, and Margaret's teacher why she won't be performing. What can Clementine say? For once, she is completely out of ideas. Essential Question How can you use what you know to help others? Read about how Clementine finds her special talent.
Stop and check. Ask and answer questions. Why does Clementine whisper in the teacher's ear? Reread page 302 to find the answer. When I walked into the auditorium, I saw Margaret's teacher and Mrs. Rice sitting at the side of the stage on tall director's chairs. I tried to hide, but Margaret's teacher saw me. She looked down at her clipboard and frowned. Then she yelled so loud all the kids in the auditorium stopped what they were doing to listen. Clementine, I don't seem to have you listed here. No matter, we'll fit you in. What's your act? I went over there and whispered in her ear that I didn't have one. I hoped the kids watching thought I was saying I couldn't choose one because I had too many talents. What do you mean you don't have one? Margaret's teacher yelled, even though I was right there. Okay, fine, maybe she didn't yell it, but all the kids were listening so hard they heard anyway. Hey, Clementine, one of the fourth graders called out. Your face looks like it's burning up. Maybe that could be your act. Stop and check. Ask and answer questions. Why does Clementine whisper in the teacher's ear? Reread page 302 to find the answer. About a million kids laughed, even though he was N-O-T, not funny. But he was right. When I get embarrassed, my face gets red and hot. So I didn't yell anything back to him. I just stood there with my red-hot face hanging down. Mrs. Rice called me over. Come sit beside me, Clementine, she said. You can keep me company during the rehearsal. So I had to sit in between Mrs. Rice and Margaret's teacher, right there at the side of the stage where all the kids could see me and know that I had no talents. The first act was called A Dozen Doozy Cartwheelers. Twelve kids lined up, six on each side of the stage. Wait! I yelled. I ran into the gym and dragged a tumbling mat back into the auditorium. I placed it on the floor in front of the stage. Then I got some of the dozen doozies to help me. Pretty soon we had all the mats piled up. Margaret's teacher was glaring at me. She tapped her watch. They're going over, I explained. No matter how they start off aiming, some of them are going over. And they did. At least half a dozen of the doozies went flying off the stage and right onto the mats. As soon as we got those kids back up and checked them for broken bones, I saw something else with my amazing corner eyes. Stop! I yelled. Then I ran over and grabbed a handful of crackers from one of the third graders just before they went into his mouth. You're up next, I reminded him, and you're whistling Yankee Doodle Dandy. No crackers. When I got back, Margaret's teacher gave me a look that said she was going to remember all this nonsense when I got to her grade. But Mrs. Rice gave me a thumbs up. Thank you, Clementine, she said. Those crackers could have been a problem. And you will not believe what happened next. Margaret's teacher apologized. I'm sorry, she said. I'm a little antsy tonight. I wanted to stick around to hear about why she was antsy. But just then I noticed that the super-duper hula-hoopers had been hula-hooping for a while. I went over and asked them how long they were planning to go on. The girl on the right said, I once went for five hours and thirteen minutes. The girl on the left made a face that said, That's nothing. Well, you need to have an ending tonight, I said. There are a lot of acts after yours. I borrowed the jump roper's CD player and explained about how they could hula hoop to the music and then S-T-O-P stop when it was over.
and I didn't even get to sit down again for the rest of the afternoon because everybody needed my help for something. Finally, after everyone had a chance to practice their acts, I went over to Mrs. Rice. May I go into your office and use the phone? I need to call my parents and tell them not to come. I think it's a little late for that, Mrs. Rice showed me her watch and then called out, Take your places, people. Five minutes to showtime. Everybody ran to their places. I ran to the curtains and peeked out. Every seat in the audience was filled. Margaret's teacher clapped her hands for attention. Before we get started, she said, I just want to thank you all for being part of the show. Each and every one of you is helping to raise money for the big school trip next spring, except Clementine. Okay, fine. She didn't actually say except Clementine, but you could see everyone was thinking it. Just then the secretary came over and handed her a note. Oh, oh my goodness, she cried. She jumped up out of her seat faster than I thought a grown-up should. Oh, my goodness gracious, it's now. My daughter's having her baby, my first grandchild. Go, said Mrs. Rice, it's all right. We can handle the show. Just go be with your daughter. Oh, thank you, Margaret's teacher said. And then she left so fast, she really did lose one of her bobby pins. It didn't look like lightning, though. It just looked like a bobby pin falling to the floor. Wow, I said to Mrs. Rice. So now you have to run the whole show by yourself. No, not by myself, Mrs. Rice said. I have an assistant, and that's you. Me? Oh, no, I can't. You can, and I'm certainly not doing this alone. I really can't. I don't pay attention, remember? You do pay attention, Clementine. Not always to the lesson in the classroom. But you notice more about what's going on than anyone I know. And that's exactly what I need tonight. I don't think this is a very good idea at all. Well, I do think it's a good idea. I'll prove it to you. Principal Rice called over one of the hula hoopers. Hillary, what's the second act after intermission? Hillary looked around. I don't have a program, she said. Do you want me to get you one? Mrs. Rice told her no thanks. Then she turned to me. Clementine, what's the second act after intermission? Caleb, from the fourth grade, is going to burp the Star Spangled Banner, I told her. Does he need any props? A two-liter bottle of root beer. How long will it take? Forty-one seconds. Forty-eight if he has to stop to drink extra soda at the rocket's red glare part. I rest my case, Principal Rice said. She pointed a no-buts finger at the empty director's chair. When a principal orders you to do something, it is impossible to refuse. Some part of you always gives in. So I climbed into the chair. Open the curtains, Principal Rice said, and the worried scribbling feeling exploded all through my body. Stop and check. Ask and answer questions. How does Clementine feel about being the principal's assistant? Reread page 310 to find the answer. Well, you would think those kids had never had a rehearsal. First thing, all dozen doozies cartwheeled off the edge of the stage. Well, except for one girl, who forgot to move at all. Maria and Morris Boris Norris, from my class, went on next, and they cartwheeled right off the stage, too. Nobody had to go to the emergency room, though, and the audience thought the whole thing was supposed to happen that way, so it was okay. The next act was the O'Malley twins. Lily had convinced Willie not to do the thing with his lunch and to play a duet on the piano with her instead. 
But when Lily got up to the mic to announce the act, she got so nervous she threw up. I looked at Willie, sitting on the piano bench. Willie does everything Lily does, and sure enough, he was getting ready. Not on the piano, I yelled, just in time. Then I ran over and closed the curtains quick, so the whole audience wouldn't get started too. When the janitor came running out to clean everything up, I had a good idea. Send Sidney out now, in front of the curtains, I told Mrs. Rice. Why? she asked. There's no microphone out there. That's okay. Sidney's really loud. And she's going to recite a poem, so there's no cartwheeling, just standing still. Besides, she's got really skinny feet, so she can fit out there if she stands sideways. So Sidney went on stage and stood sideways, and yelled her poem. By the time she was done, the stage was all mopped clean. Next came the hula hoopers, and they completely forgot what I told them about stopping. The music ended, but they just kept on going. Finally, I had to close the curtains to pull them off the stage so the jump ropers could go on. The jump ropers must have figured that if the hula hoopers didn't have to stop at the end of the music, neither did they. So I had to close the curtains on them, too. Then came Margaret. She did fine at the walking on stage on time thing, which not everybody did. But just as she got to the microphone, Alan took a picture of her from the audience, which was a bad mistake. Whenever anyone takes a picture of Margaret that she isn't expecting, she freezes. She says it's the horror of not knowing if she looks perfect or not, which I don't understand, because Margaret always looks perfect. No matter, there she was, frozen on the stage with her mouth hanging open. For one tiny second, a little part of me thought, Good, no showing off for you tonight but then my empathetic part took over. I ran over to where Margaret could see me and waved until I got her eyes to unfreeze. I pointed to my hair and pretended to brush it. Margaret nodded like a robot. She turned to the audience. First, always brush your hair, even if it's cut off like mine. She looked back at me. I pretended to do up some buttons. Then I pointed to my right. Always make sure you're buttoned up right, Margaret told the audience. Then I lifted my foot and crossed my fingers over my sneaker. Never wear green sneakers, Margaret said. Green sneakers are the worst. Then she shook herself, as if she'd been asleep. She went up closer to the mic. Wait a minute, she said. I was just kidding about that one. You can wear any color sneakers you want, and green is the most fashionable of all. She zoomed me a smile so huge, all her teeth bracelets sparkled like diamonds in the spotlight. I zoomed her one back, except with no teeth bracelets, because I don't have them yet. After that, Margaret was okay. I went back and climbed up onto the director's chair, and Principal Rice gave me a huge smile, too. She leaned over and said, I have the answer for you now, Clementine, about why you can't have a substitute. It's because there is no substitute for you. You are one of a kind. And that's when I realized I didn't have the worried feeling anymore. Instead, I had the proud feeling, 
like the sun was rising inside my chest. The proud sunrising feeling stayed with me all through the rest of the show. And no matter what went wrong, which was plenty, Mrs. Rice and I just fixed it. Stop and check. Visualize. Use the descriptions to visualize Clementine's actions at the end of the story. How does she feel? All right, that takes us to the end of our story about the talented Clementine. I know it's a bit longer than a lot of the stories that we've read, um, but this is another short story about Clementine, um, and we're going to get started with this one as well. This is also realistic fiction. Genre. Realistic fiction. Compare texts. Read about how Clementine's parents help her gain confidence and get ready for a change. From Clementine and the Family Meeting by Sarah Pennypacker Pictures by Marla Frazzi It's almost time for the family meeting at Clementine's house, and Clementine is really nervous. What did she and her little brother do this time? Did she eat too much junk food? Maybe she misplaced one of Dad's tools. Both Mom and Dad have assured her that this meeting is only about good news. But Clementine is not so sure. My dad called the meeting to order. We are a very lucky family, he said. Very lucky. What's on the agenda? I asked. I'm getting to that, my dad said. Now families change. They grow. It's hard to believe, but you're eight and a half now, and your brother's almost four. I clapped my hands over my brother's ears. Should we have a surprise party for him? You know what would make a great present? A gorilla! His birthday's not for a few months, my mom said. I vote we table that discussion for another time. Well, so what's the good thing we have to talk about tonight? I asked. My dad looked at my mom and raised his eyebrows. My mom looked back at him and smiled. She waved her palm to him like a game show host, as if to say, Show us these great prizes, Bill. My dad looked at my mom again, and this time he looked like he was going to cry. Not in a sad way, but in an I-can't-believe-how-lucky-I-am-that-you're-here way. Which was nuts, because my mom is always here. Families grow, he said again, and tonight, he stopped and smiled at my mom again. Tonight your mother and I want to talk to you about an addition to our family. Our family is about to grow again. And then finally, I figured out what he was saying. I slid Peapod off my lap and jumped up to give my dad and mom a hug. Yes, thank you. Yes, you won't be sorry. I promise I'll take good care of it. You'll barely even notice it's here. Thank you. Cauliflower was sitting on the floor looking between me and our parents, completely clueless. I leaned over and squeezed him hard. We're getting a gorilla after all. My mom fell back against her chair laughing. Oh, Clementine, she said. It's definitely not a gorilla. I was a little tiny bit relieved. The truth is, since I got my kitten, I'm not sure I really want a gorilla anymore. That would be a really big litter box. I studied my parents. What is it then? A pony? We're getting a pony? My dad pulled me over to him and held my hands. We're talking about a new baby a brother or a sister for you two. What do you think about that? What I thought about that was, N-O, no thanks. I yelled it. No thanks, Parsnip echoed. Then he looked up at me. No thanks what? No thanks to more people. 
Our family is four. There are four sides to a puzzle, so we can all work on it at once. Hot dogs come in packages of eight, so we can each have two. At the playground, four is an even number for the seesaws. Four can all be together in the car. Four can be two and two sometimes, and nobody is lonely. Two kids and two grown-ups, two boys and two girls. There are four sides to the kitchen table, so we each get one. Four is a perfect number for a family. While I'd been explaining all this, my brother had snuck over to his favorite cupboard and thrown all the pots and pans out like a personal-sized tornado. He was sitting inside now, crashing lids together. I pointed to the mess in the kitchen. Look at us. Lima Bean puts toy trucks in the ziti, and we used a drill gun to stir the muffins this morning because we couldn't find the mixer, and my rat is missing, which isn't my fault, and so is my hat. And maybe that is my fault, but how is a baby going to help with anything? That's what I want to know. It's all moving too fast, and we're not ready. Oh, honey, my mom said, life is always moving too fast, and we're never ready. That's how life is, but somehow, that's just perfect. She dragged Zucchini out of the cupboard and hauled him off to get his pajamas on. Your mother, my dad said, is exactly right. Things are always changing. That's life. And this? He spread his hands to the tornadoed kitchen. Us? Toy truck ziti? Missing hats? Drill gun mixers? Well, this is how we roll, Clementine. This is how we roll. Make Connections How do Clementine's parents help her understand the changes in her family? How are the plot and setting and theme in the two stories about Clementine alike? How are they different? All right, that takes us to the end of our literature anthology book. I know those were really long. Uh, we've got one more short one for our reading and writing workshop called The Impossible Pet Show. This one's also realistic fiction, so we're staying within the same genre of something that didn't happen, but it could possibly happen in real life. Genre. Realistic fiction. The Impossible Pet Show. Essential question. How can you use what you know to help others? Read how Daniel uses what he knows to save a pet show. My best friend Carla Hernandez called me on Thursday afternoon. Daniel, Meet me in the park near the playground in five minutes. I have a great idea. This worried me because Carla's great ideas almost always mean big trouble for me. I dashed outside and jogged to the park. When I saw Carla, my heart sank because her gigantic dog Perro was with her. I liked everything about Carla except Perro. I've never had a pet, so I feel uncomfortable and nervous around animals. I'm embarrassed to say that I'm afraid of Carla's dog. Carla smiled. Isn't this the perfect location for a pet show? She asked. All the kids in the neighborhood can show off their pet's talents and demonstrate the things they do well. There are plenty of comfortable benches for our parents and friends to sit on. And since you don't have a pet to enter into the show, you will be the announcer. I'm sorry, I apologized, but that's impossible. Crowds make me nervous and unsure. Besides, I don't like animals, remember? That's nonsense, said Carla. There's nothing to be concerned about because you'll be great. Just then, Perro leaped up, slobbered all over me, and almost knocked me down. Yuck, down, Perro, stay, I shouted. Perro sat as still as a statue. Wow, you're good at that, said Carla. Now let's get started, because we have a lot to do. By Saturday morning, I had practiced announcing each pet's act a hundred times. My stomach was doing flip-flops by the time the audience arrived. 
The size of the crowd made me feel even more anxious. When the show began, I gulped and announced the first pet. It was a parakeet named Butter, whose talent was walking back and forth on a wire. When Butter finished, everyone clapped and cheered. So far, everything was perfect, and I was beginning to feel calmer and more relaxed. I realized that being an announcer wasn't so bad after all. Then it was Carla and Perro's turn. Sit, Perro, she said. But Perro didn't sit. Perro was not paying attention to Carla. He was too interested in watching Jack's bunnies jump in and out of their boxes. Suddenly, Perro leaped at the bunnies who hopped toward Mandy and knocked over her hamster's cage. Pudgy, the hamster, escaped and began running around in circles while Kyle's dog, Jake, howled. This was a disaster, and I had to do something. Sit, I shouted at Perro. Quiet, I ordered Jake. Stay, I yelled. Everyone, kids and pets, stopped and stared at me. Even the audience froze. Daniel, that was incredible, said Carla. You got the pets to settle down. That's quite an achievement. Sadly, that was the end of our pet show. But now I have more confidence when I have to speak in front of people. And even though I am still nervous around animals, Perro and I have become great friends. And I've discovered my talent, too. Make Connections How did Daniel use what he knows to help others? Discuss whether you would like to take part in a pet show, and why. All right, that takes us to the end of our stories for this week. I know we had several long stories, but I hope you guys did enjoy them. We're going to talk about our comprehension strategies and skills right now, and then uh, about our genre and our vocab strategy. So our comprehension strategy for this week is to ask and answer questions. And that's something we do when we come across information that we don't understand. We ask questions and we look for the answers to those questions to help us get a better understanding of what the author is sharing with us. Ask and answer questions. Stop and ask yourself questions about The Impossible Pet Show as you read. Then look for story details to answer your questions. Find text evidence. Reread page 277. Ask a question about what is happening. Then read again to find the answer. I dashed outside and jogged to the park. When I saw Carla, my heart sank because her gigantic dog Perro was with her. I liked everything about Carla except Perro. I've never had a pet, so I feel uncomfortable and nervous around animals. I'm embarrassed to say that I'm afraid of Carla's dog. Carla smiled. Isn't this the perfect location for a pet show? she asked. All the kids in the neighborhood can show off their pet's talents and demonstrate the things they do well. There are plenty of comfortable benches for our parents and friends to sit on. And since you don't have a pet to enter into the show, you will be the announcer. I have a question. Why are Carla's ideas trouble for Daniel? Daniel is uncomfortable around pets. Carla asks him to help at the pet show. Carla's ideas are trouble because she is asking Daniel to do something he is not comfortable doing. All right, next let's talk about our comprehension skill, which is point of view. So when we're talking about the point of view of somebody in a story, we're looking at things from their perspective. So how are they seeing it? How are they understanding it? What are their thoughts about it? Point of view. Point of view is what a narrator thinks about other characters or events in a story. Look for details that show what the narrator thinks. Use them to figure out the point of view. Find text evidence. I read on page 277 that animals make Daniel nervous and uncomfortable. This will help me figure out what Daniel's point of view is about being an announcer for the pet show. Graphic organizer. Details. 
Daniel says he is uncomfortable and nervous around animals. Next up, we have our genre for this week, and we said we were talking about realistic fiction. Now, remember, realistic fiction is still fiction. It's still a made-up story, um, and it has all the elements of a made-up story, or most of the elements of a made-up story, where you have dialogue, where the characters talk to each other. Uh, you have um, a series of events that happen throughout the story, but all of these events and these characters could be real. So realistic fiction means it's not real, but it could happen in real life because it has all of the same elements of a real story. Realistic fiction. The Impossible Pet Show is realistic fiction. Realistic fiction is a made up story that could really happen, has dialogue and illustrations may be part of a longer book with chapters or part of a series about the same characters. Find text evidence. I can tell that The Impossible Pet Show is realistic fiction. The characters talk and act like real people. The events are made up, but they could really happen. Dialogue. Dialogue is what the characters say to each other. Illustrations. Illustrations give more information or details about the characters and setting in a story. All right, and lastly, we're going to review prefixes similar to the ones we talked about during our notes. Prefixes. A prefix is a word part added to the beginning of a word. A prefix changes the word's meaning. The prefixes un, non, and im mean not or opposite of. The prefix pre means before. Find text evidence. On page 278, I see the word unsure. It has the root word sure and the prefix un. I know that sure means certain, and the prefix un means not. The word unsure must mean not certain. Crowds make me nervous and unsure. All right, that takes us to the end of our notes for this week, third grade. If you guys have any questions, definitely let me know. Join our Zoom sessions. Otherwise, I hope you have an amazing week.